it seems to me important to present yourselves as actually uh, engaged in German patriotism in a way, that you're liberating Germany from its own dark past. <laughs> uh, uh, because that's what it really is. It, it really comes down to the understanding that if you want to get rid of anti-Semitism, you've got to begin to take criminality seriously wherever it occurs. And you can't choose your, uh, you, you can't choose your criminals uh, because of your history. And, and uh, and and this, this kind of film and the kind of uh, language that both uh, both of you have uh, used so effectively uh, is part of the awakening, the wider awakening of German society. The people who know there are a lot of people who uh, watch as spectators mm -hmm. what's going on and are quietly sympathetic, but as Archbishop Tutu, I think, was the one that, uh, if you see evil and do nothing, you're part of the evil. And to make that understood more widely uh, seems to me to be uh, a way of enlarging the circle of solidarity and, and to deepen the, the, the engagement of those that are already uh, with you and the understanding, as you put it there, I think very well, that this is something collective and larger than the three of you, and that the three of you acted in this, uh, what I felt to be courageous and uh, a pro morally appropriate way, uh, as a kind of uh, uh, wake up, uh, ex uh, an alarm bell, I strongly believe that there is a place for a direct action to stop uh, the, facilitate the, the perpetuation of, of, of war, especially knowing that the Israeli, Israeli drones have been tested on the people of Gaza. And we've been, uh, we've been together, we have seen in our own eyes, and it is burned into my memory, how German representative, with no shame, have voted in favor of buying those Israeli drones tested on the people of Gaza. This is a moral failure that needs to be challenged. And now I would uh, give the stage to my uh, comrades. I'm a dreamer. I've always been. I'm very hopeful and positive, everybody knows. And I really see that we are going to be liberated very soon. You know, maybe in my lifetime, but I'm sure it's in my lifetime. Anyway. And therefore, I am, uh, uh, that's why I see, I, like, in, in, my, in my dream and in my uh, real world, I see BDS as, as very much uh, a place where we as Palestinians unite about. I, I see my people, whatever they choose in such circumstances, it is their choice. If you live the life they live, they live at the moments, then you will choose what they're choosing at the moment. So I, this, with this, I really, I argue most of you to respect the choice of my people. That is one thing. Uh, I think that guilt and fear are very debilitating uh, factors and that we have to overcome, especially as activists. And here in Germany, of all places, this is kind of the way that it is used the most, possibly, uh, whenever we come to discuss our responsibility, German responsibility and uh, individual uh, responsibility as human beings to oppose crimes against humanity, one of which is what Israel is doing on a daily basis for the past seven decades. And so I'd like to ask you, not how we overcome uh, the fear and the guilt and so on, we have just have to do that ourselves, but what is our responsibility in all of that? And also when I speak of myself, many activists, well, there aren't many activists, there are very few activists who are Israeli activists, but among those, many of them, uh, I feel that they have a lot of, they feel a lot of guilt for the situation. And I don't feel guilty for being born in a certain way, uh, white, privileged, white male, uh, uh, Israeli, Jewish, etc. 
uh, I was born in certain, into a certain situation uh, where I am privileged, either by birth or by law, because I'm a privileged Israeli Jew by law. This is the way that the state defines me. Uh, so I don't feel guilty about being born in that way. It just means that I carry more responsibility. And, a resp and responsibility is what is kind of a driving force to act rather than the debilitating force of fear and guilt. So what is our responsibility of individuals, of NGOs, of, of obviously state actors to fight uh, crimes against humanity? No, that's a, a really uh, important way of um, uh, expressing the central issue. See, one thing that I didn't say, and I think is very uh, relevant to all this, is that we wouldn't be having this discussion 10 years ago. It is the success of the global solidarity movement and BDS campaign that has produced this pushback on the part of uh, the Zionist movement. It, it is the success, in a way, that has produced this intensifying uh, effort to discredit support for uh, the Palestinian struggle. You might have had a few hostile questions 10 years ago, but you wouldn't have had the effort to uh, criminalize support for uh, BDS or uh, to uh, try to uh, deny people a venue to hold meetings and uh, and that, none of that happened in the anti-apartheid movement directed at uh, South Africa. So in one sense, it's, it should be uh, raise your morale to appreciate that this movement is succeeding. And, and uh, that's, uh, it's hard to keep, because all the official media want you to think it's failing. So it's very important to see beyond that to see the uh, realities of how struggles in this historical period are waged and how they end. And I think one does build hope from that kind of historical perspective. Much of what we do is about symbolism. Why did Ali Tamimi, who slapped the soldier, spend time in jail? This young girl, teenager, slapping a fully armed soldier, etc., invading her home. Why did she spend time in jail? Why did it get so much attention? Because of that symbolism that is apparently very powerful. When we went to the fence of the Gaza ghetto and we called the Israeli soldiers them, we referred to them as terrorists, that went viral. And then Netanyahu responded and uh, Lieberman responded. Now they're legislating a law against us for that one specific action trying to say that we are not allowed to film Israeli soldiers on duty. This is because we have touched this open nerve. And the same applies to what we did at the Humboldt University and in other places around the world, ourselves or other people who are challenging these apartheid representatives. We are using that symbolism. We are speaking up exactly where they cannot silence us, where they cannot just simply brush it off. And that's kind of the power of it all. We need to imagine the post-apartheid order. We need to make it, we need to bring, we, we need to be the midwives of that order. It will be whatever we want it to be. I personally imagine it as one space, free of racism, where equality is the only thing that governs. Equality and freedom and fraternity. And so this is the basic foundation on which I think the post-apartheidist order can be established. And of course, an order with no masters and slaves, no superior and, infer and inferior, full equality, from the river to the sea. Oh. Uh, just let me add the word, uh, a word that uh, what you just heard is very much uh, the vision that Edward Said uh, had uh, shortly before his uh, death. And he very much believed in what uh, precisely that uh, notion of equality as the foundation of a, a humane Palestine.